I'm delighted to be here with Chris Kandar, who's a good friend. Uh, he's a social entrepreneur, former lecturer at the University of Oxford, former president of the London School of Theology, and author of many books, including one of my favourite, oh, Home yeah. for Good. And he's founder and, and, and was director of the charity Home for Good, media commentator often on the BBC. But most recently, he's been appointed as advisor to the Eng English government as the chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board. He is a father. He, uh, he's married to Miriam. They have three birth children, one adopted daughter and two long-term foster children. Much more about that later. But, um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you have an, ex uh, an amazing story. Just, just tell us a little bit about your, your background. So I, I was born in Brighton, but my mother was born in India and my father was born in Malaysia. My father's father was born in Sri Lanka. And my mother's father was born in Ireland. So I'm a complete mix. So good. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, that in itself is amazing. And my, my parents um, moved to the UK, uh, met each other. My mum had quite a difficult time. She ended up living in an orphanage for many years and was kind of rescued from it by a grand aunt, trained to be a nurse. And uh, she used to open her house on a Friday night for all the people that felt they didn't really fit in in Brighton in that time. She'd faced quite a lot of racist abuse, but she launched this kind of one woman resistance movement by cooking up a vat of curry and a vat of rice. And anyone that wanted to come around came around. And my dad was one of those hungry students who used to come around. So they got married. Uh, my, my sister and I uh, were born. And my dad was from a Hindu background. My mum was from a Catholic background. And they decided they wouldn't induct us in either faith, my sister and I. We could choose for ourselves. And it was through a friend at school uh, when I was a teenager that I became a follower of Jesus. Amazing. And just say a little bit more about that faith journey for you. Well, I went to an all boys comprehensive school in Brighton and it was a rough place. In the middle of this, one of my friends, a guy called Steve, he went out to the front and he asked the teacher if he could make an announcement. And he told everybody that the night before he'd become a Christian. He'd been at an event at the Brighton Centre with a guy called John Wimber and he'd become a Christian. Wow. And he wanted all of us to know about that. Amazing. I went, I went straight to see him afterwards and I said, look, Steve, you're new to this. I've been secretly going to church, but you don't tell anyone about this. It's just a private thing between you and God. And Steve said to me, if you had met the God that I'd met last night, you'd want the world to know about it. Mm. And I realized from him that he had something different to me. I, I was I, I had churchianity. You know, I, I went to church, but I didn't have this living relationship that he had with God. Even he, he was a day old as a Christian. And yet he had something I didn't have. And so through him, I became a follower of Jesus and it, it revolutionized my life. Amazing. And you got married to Miriam. You had three young children. We well, did. they were young to begin with, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We we were under 30 and we had three children in three years. And I thought I'd contributed to global population growth as necessary. And then my wife says, you know what? I, I think we've got capacity to care for some more children. Let's become foster parents. And to be honest, I thought that was a great idea for other people because, you know, three children in short succession means there's a time in our future that those three children might leave home and, you know, go to work or university. And then it will be my wife and I again. And we go for long romantic walks along beaches. And, you know, it will be wonderful. And fostering really wasn't on the agenda. But some things happened to me. So some friends of ours in their 60s became foster parents for the first time to teenage children. And I thought, whoa, you know, if they could do that in their 60s, maybe we could do that in our 30s. And the other thing that happened, it's an occupational hazard if you're a Christian. God spoke to me through the Bible. You know, it, it was weird. How did I miss what, it? Almost... What, what was it in the Bible? What passage was it? Well, it, it wasn't just one passage. It was over and over God saying that we needed to care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And, and Nikki, I know you do your Bible in a year. And it just comes up all the time, doesn't yes, it? Yes. It's in Isaiah 1, it's in Isaiah 58, it's in uh, Amos, um, it's in Deuteronomy, it's yeah. in Exodus, uh, and then New Testament, it just keeps jumping out. And James 1.27 was particularly powerful to me uh, when it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans in their distress. 
that really challenged me. If God was, you know, evaluating the worship of his people, caring for the widow and the orphan is top priority. That really spoke to me. And so I was in and we got our first call and it was a little girl that had just been born. Her mum had all sorts of challenges in her life. She loved this little girl, but she couldn't care for her because of uh, those challenges. And so off we went. And I remember the moment when we put the Moses basket in the back seat and I'm having a moment because I'm going, Moses, he, he was like the first foster child, wasn't he? And, and we're going to go and pick up our first foster child. And it, it was it was just wonderful. And that little foster girl um, ended up living us, with us for a couple of years. They tried to rehabilitate her with her mum. That didn't work out. And so this little girl still lives with us today. She's our adopted daughter and oh, she's wow. a wonderful addition in our lives. Oh, but it hasn't all been easy, has it? I mean, it, it's like there's some real tough. I mean, that's an amazing story. But there have been some tough challenges as well, haven't there? Yeah. The, the hard thing is hearing the stories of what children have experienced. You know, children in care have experienced some of the worst things you could imagine. Abuse and neglect. And, and hearing those stories is heartbreaking. And and. You know, it, you just think, how, how can we possibly pour love into these children's lives that's going to replace all the pain that they've had? You know, and, and it is hard. And you, you, you see children that have had so many bad things happen to them. That kind of works its way out in difficult to manage behavior. People need to have, you know, clear sight of this. This isn't just, you know, Anne of Green Gables or Despicable Me yeah. when we all kind of dance off into the sunset. It's, it's really tough, but it is the most rewarding thing that we've ever done as a family. But I mean, some of the the challenges um, because you you uh, you have have these children in your home, um, you grow to love them. They become part of your family, but you never know when they might no longer be part of your family. That's right, Nikki. Um, probably the hardest time is when a child moves on to be adopted or reunited with their family. And you, you kind of keep it together as best you can when this new family is kind of climbing into a car and the child's been strapped into a car seat and you're trying to smile so that this little child, their last memory of you is smiles. But then when they go, it's like having your heart ripped out. Yeah, and you had one and, particularly, didn't you, where, who was with you, I think, till she was three, was that right? Yeah, she was with us for nearly four years. Uh, we had her straight from hospital. And it, it was really hard. It was hard when we we dropped her off with her adoptive family and they said, we never want to see you again. And I'm going, well, well why is that? It's because it's this child loves you. And I'm going, well, of course she loves us. We've been her parents for the last four years, but we, we want to do everything we can to make this work for you. And I think I handed them a DVD back in the day when DVDs were the thing with probably 10,000 photographs of this little girl. She'd been oh. with us on every holiday and every Christmas and every celebration and every birthday party. So I wanted this little girl to know that she'd had love in her life for all of those four years. Yeah. And um, the hardest moment was when we, we mailed a birthday present for her and it got sent back to us in the post. And they said, we really want no contact with you because we want her to be our child. And, and that, that was really hard. That must have been so hard, uh, that moment. It was hard. And sometimes people say to me, you know, Krish, I, I could never be a foster parent. I'd love the children too much to give them up. And I want to say, look, it, it is hard. It is painful to see the child move on. But we need to understand what love is. Yeah. Um, if you're saying I won't get involved in a child's life because I'm afraid of getting hurt, yeah. that isn't love. That's self-protection. You know, we see in God's love that he's willing to suffer in order to help us. He's willing to lay down his life in order to uh, give us life and, and forgiveness. So when we're willing to suffer for those that we love, we're modeling something of the love of God. And it is painful, but no one promised love was going to be easy. Yeah. And I, I, Chris, I know that you, of course, you have to be very confidential about all the um, aspects of this. But but uh, I, I mean, can you say roughly how many children have you have you sort of fostered or adopt, uh, had been in through your home is that confidential or can you say no we can say uh, we, we've had around 30 some have come for a night and some like that little girl was with us for four years we have committed that we will look after the children for as long as they need it we don't want to see children bouncing around the care system just staying here and there so we're always saying we are here for as long as these children need us to be and and that's how we ended up adopting some and, and having 
uh, others for life, you know, long-term foster children. And the, the ones that you've talked about came to you as babies, but I think you've had children coming to you at, at all ages. We have. I remember one boy, he, he turned up at our front door. He was huge. He was taller than me. And that's not hard. I'm only little. Um, he was about 12 or 13 at the time. And he was huge. And he had this big pink suitcase that obviously wasn't his. That was the suitcase the social worker gave him. And he'd come to us straight from A&E. And it was, it was really sad. He had a big gash on his face and a burn on his arm. And a family member had actually assaulted him. And that's why he'd gone into to care. And I remember I was trying to get get him to feel okay. You know, he's there in my lounge. He's all curled up, won't give me any eye contact. I'm normally quite good at talking to people, but I couldn't get him to say anything. And then my teenage boys, uh, I think they were 13 and 14 at the time, they used a therapeutic tool I wasn't aware of. It's called an Xbox. <laughs> and uh, challenged him to a game of FIFA soccer game. And it, it was just such an amazing proud dad moment. I heard them say, well done, mate, great shot. You're really good at this. And just their words of encouragement unlocked this boy and it made him sit up straight. It made him engage with us. We went shopping later that evening. He hadn't got a toothbrush, so we had to go down the Sainsbury's to get him a toothbrush. And I'm like the father hen with these little chicks following me down the aisles looking for a toothbrush. And he, he cracked a joke. He says, you don't come here very often, do you, Chris? And I thought, whoa, you know, three hours earlier, you couldn't look me in the eye. Yeah. Now you're cracking jokes. And that was a real God moment for me in an aisle in Sainsbury's. I felt something of the, the grace of God, that this is how God feels for us. He loves us as a father. He wants us to be in a family. And we get the privilege of passing that on to kids in need. We often hear, don't we, that, that, that families would love to adopt. How, how come there's this mismatch? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. So sometimes it's about the system. And, you know, I'm, I'm working now with the government to try and reform that system. Sometimes the system it isn't as friendly. It's a bit bureaucratic. Um, social workers are doing a fantastic job, but they're kind of really under the cosh with the, the caseloads that they have. So sometimes there's problems at end. And, and that's part of my job is to try and fix that. Um, but sometimes it's also about the adopters. Um, according to the adoption barometer that's out there that measures you know, the state of play with adoption, most people that come forward for adoption come forward because of infertility. And when infertility is your driver, and, and to be fair, we as churches are not brilliant at pastorally caring for people that are going through that pain. Yeah. But when infertility is your driver, you often want the baby you've been unable to have. And the children that are waiting for adoption are older sibling groups, often with additional needs. And so the children that are available and the children that are wanted are not the same thing. So we've always said, look, all of us could consider adoption. Um, when God adopted us into his family, it wasn't because of a need in God. You know, God adopted us not because he needed it, but because we needed it. He stepped up and became the heavenly father that we needed him to be. And that, that's the same with adoption. You know, I already had three children. I didn't need any more kids, but prompted by my wife, the Bible, hopefully the love of God, we, we've stepped into this new place. And it's, it's tough, but it's incredibly rewarding. So we've been so excited to see single people come forward for adoption. Uh, we've seen young families that have come uh, who've decided adoption is plan A. They're not even going to try and have birth children. That, that, that's how they felt led by God. We've met other people who have children and they, you know, add to their family through adoption. And we've seen people with fertility challenges saying, do you know what? A three-year-old is going to need a parent just as much as a newborn baby. Maybe I could step up for them. And uh, Chris, you're, you're amazing. What, the things that you've achieved and the different things that you've, you've done. But I know you have a new vision um, for the people of Hong Kong. And um, uh, I mean, I only know what I read in the newspapers, but you can see that uh, there's possibly 130,000 people coming from Hong Kong. Um, and just say, so what is, what, is the, what is the need and what is the vision? Mm. So I think the golden thread in my life is hospitality. You know, showing hospitality to vulnerable children through fostering adoption is always going to be a part of my life. That's that's our family. That's home for good. That's what I get up in the morning to do. Um, but 130,000 people coming from Hong Kong this year alone will be the largest planned migration of people to the UK from outside of Europe since Windrush. Hmm. And, you know, we know 50 years later 
that what we fail to do in terms of offering welcome, justice, kindness to that generation coming from the Caribbean has huge knock-on consequences even today. There are people that are still suffering as a result of that uh, inhumanity that was shown. So I'm leading a movement of civil society. The church is involved. Just this week, we found out that 460 churches have signed up to become what we're saying, Hong Kong ready, trying to offer people very simple, practical help. If you've moved into a new neighborhood and you don't speak English very well, having someone at the end of a phone at your local church, you can say, do you know what? The bins go out on Thursday. I can help you get sorted with a GP. I can help you get your children into a local school help you with some of those forms that's a life giver to those people and what a wonderful thing if it's the church that's the first call that people make that's an opportunity to demonstrate really practically the love of god uh chris i uh, as uh, i think you know my my father was a refugee so i feel very strongly um i always get a bit choked up but i'm so grateful to uh this country for welcoming him because I would not exist if wow. if Britain had not welcomed my father as a refugee because like Incredible. many of his family he would have died in a in a concentration camp in in under the Nazis but Chris you uh, talk about um being a blessing um and you definitely are a blessing to to us to to HGB to the church of the UK and much more widely than that thank you so much for everything that that um you've said today and uh, for, for what you have brought. And you know, they said of Jesus, he was a man of integrity. There's no higher, higher compliment than that. And you are definitely a man of integrity. So Chris Kandar, thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki.